So, humans cannot have appeared through evolution. Evolutionary theory is just a scam. I believe you must have come across such viewpoints. Ever since I started making videos about evolutionary stories, I frequently receive these types of comments. In reality, these people are opposing not the academic understanding of evolution, but rather some baseless and sensationalized videos on YouTube. They encounter a distorted version of evolution, which they mistakenly believe represents the scientific consensus. Their main arguments against evolution are typically these. If humans evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Humans have had civilizations for thousands of years, so why haven't we evolved further? Why haven't we found fossil evidence of transitional forms? Let's explain Darwin's theory without discussing humans at first. Let's talk about dogs, and you'll understand. Dogs around the world, from the massive Tibetan mastiffs to tiny chihuahuas, and from clever border collies to seemingly silly huskies, are all part of the same biological species, the gray wolf, just like the one in Little Red Riding Hood. The emergence of dogs as a distinct species was entirely due to human influence. Dogs only appeared around 20,000 years ago, and through generations of human selection, we ended up with wolves that were obedient to humans and could best cooperate with us. Eventually, the wild traits of wolves were mostly eliminated from their genetics, giving rise to this new subspecies called dogs. However, over the last few hundred years, with an increase in pet dogs, we started breeding them according to our preferences, resulting in various breeds with genetic defects. For instance, we have breeds with short legs like corgis, bull breeds with developmental issues and drooling, and tiny dogs like chihuahuas, which would not survive long in the wild. Despite these dogs being unfit in nature, they have become revered as pure bird through generations of breeding within their specific traits. Now here comes the question. With so many dog breeds, does that mean wolves no longer exist? Likewise, the existence of humans does not negate the existence of monkeys. This is the core of Darwin's theory of evolution, natural selection. It's not the unrealistic kind of evolution seen in something like Digital Monster, as imagined by those who oppose evolution. But rather, between each generation, there will be slight differences in traits, height, weight, big noses, small eyes, and so on. If there really is such a hand that selectively allows certain traits to survive and pass on to offspring, while others cannot survive and have no descendants, then over several generations, a certain set of traits within a population will become inherent to the new species. It inherits the selected trait. So, my friends who oppose evolution, do you understand now? The cost of evolution is not about use it or lose it. The true cost of evolution is death. This selection can be as we previously discussed, where humans selected dogs, or it can be the natural environment screening. After all, survival of the fittest. Of course, you can even call this intangible hand a god, just like I do, jokingly referring to it as the flying spaghetti monster. It doesn't matter, because on the opposite side of Darwin's theory is creationism. Creationism believes that millions, billions, or even more species were created by an old white-bearded man. Just think about it, that's highly improbable, the workload would be enormous. However, during Darwin's time, he did face one dilemma, how species spontaneously generate various trait differences between generations. Thus, he could only resort to an agnostic stance. As a result, a group of charlatans packaged this into a religious belief. It's as if, just because Darwin had faith in a religion, evolution suddenly became a scam. Moreover, the problems that Darwin couldn't resolve have long been addressed by modern biological theories. All the biological traits are controlled by a large molecule called nucleic acid, which is DNA and RNA, also known as genes. The sequence of bases on it is like a series of codes that are transcribed into all our cells and tissues. When cells undergo replication and proliferation, DNA undergoes duplication, and during that process, 
there's a chance of errors occurring. These errors can lead to differences in traits, and these minor differences can manifest in significant ways. So, modern biological theories have already proven Darwin's theory of evolution. The reason why the vast majority of species have lifespans, undergo cancerous mutations, and even require sexual reproduction is precisely because they need to make mistakes. Only through mistakes can their genes withstand the tests imposed by the environment. In 2003, the SARS virus in China had such a high mortality rate that it killed its hosts, leading to its own extinction. On the other hand, we have bacteriophages in our bodies, which turned into viruses that only attack bacteria and have lived in harmony with us. This is the second core of evolution, adaptation. So when we talk about survival of the fittest, the focus is on survival. As we mentioned earlier, evolution comes at the cost of death, and it can be quite cruel. So, did humans really not undergo evolution? If we look at the statistics of ancient female pelvises, they were significantly larger than those of women in the last hundred years. This is because in the past, with low medical standards, difficult childbirth often resulted in death. Now with cesarean sections, narrow pelvises are not selected out. Similar examples can be found in the protruding jaws of ancient humans compared to modern humans. In the past, this trait was necessary for chewing tough food. Otherwise, they would starve. But with the advent of the agricultural era and softer, refined food, the jaw gradually moved backward, reducing its chewing ability. However, since the food was no longer hard, the trait was not selected out. Yet, the receding jaw is more suited to a complex consonant system, which is why human language is so rich, enabling us to construct complex societies. Then, there are the troublesome wisdom teeth and the appendix. They are typical examples of traits that are currently undergoing evolution. However, unfortunately, I believe these traits are likely difficult to evolve further, because modern medicine can treat these issues. You won't die from an inflamed appendix, so the gene for it is less likely to be subjected to natural selection. Ancient human societies eliminated many genes through high mortality rates and the inability to reproduce. But once we solve the issues of death and reproduction, biological evolution is inevitably slowed down. Moreover, Earth's history spans 4.6 billion years, and it took 3.9 billion years to evolve from single-celled organisms to humans. From southern apes to humans, it took over 5 million years. Our civilization history is merely around 10,000 years. Do you really think you will witness significant evolution in such a short time? Want to become Magneto from X-Men? Humans, as part of the animal kingdom, are somewhat failures in the eyes of primates. In ancient times, when traits like upright walking and increased intelligence appeared, we didn't have many advantages over agile and nimble monkeys or strong gorillas. We were simply the result of being selected in harsher environments. Our relatives like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Neanderthals have all become dust in history. But one of our ancestors, who experienced a trait mutation, finally allowed intelligence to completely dominate over other traits. It compensated for all our deficiencies, making us true primates. But here comes the but that I like to say. For the Earth, all our civilizations are nothing more than a layer of dust. If the Earth becomes angry, we will still be selected out. In reality, there is no hierarchical classification of genes or traits. Humans, monkeys, cockroaches, amoebas, they are all the same in the eyes of Earth. It's just that our genes have adapted and survived in their respective environments. This process of selection and adaptation has led to many incredible changes in traits and evolution. For example, although dinosaurs became extinct, one branch of theropods evolved into the vast array of flying birds, including the chicken leg you might have for lunch. In the ocean, dolphins and whales are both classified as artiodactyla in biology. Artiodactyla includes animals like pigs, cows, sheep, hippos, and camels. 
Maybe I will make a separate video on this topic. Because dolphins and whales drink milk and breathe through lungs, in Darwin's On the Origin of Species, he suggested that the ancestors of whales might have been certain land mammals that were forced into the sea and evolved into their current fish-like appearance. This conclusion was mocked for a long time, but with the discovery of fossils like Pachycetus and Ambulocetus natans, which were four-legged whales, Darwin's hypothesis was proven correct. Especially with recent genetic sequencing results, it's shown that hippos and whales share very similar genes. The relationship between pigs and whales is similar to that of monkeys and humans. So, the notion of lacking intermediate fossils is just a one-sided view of anti-intellectualism. If you stay updated on the latest scientific news, you wouldn't make such absurd claims. These people who oppose the theory of evolution often shout loudly that it's just a hypothesis. My response is that, of course, evolution is a hypothesis, and there's no need for you to emphasize that. It is precisely because evolution is a hypothesis that it is true science. Today, let me provide a simple explanation. Please remember this. Scientific research itself involves proposing hypotheses, conducting experiments, making inductions, and then proving or disproving them. Was Newton's law of universal gravitation a hypothesis? Of course it was. Newton never went to the moon, but now our Voyager 2 is about to leave the solar system, and all the experimental data have not disproven universal gravitation. Instead, they align with the formula. So we say that the law of universal gravitation is scientific. However, this law encounters problems at high masses and velocities, which Einstein's theory of general relativity supplemented and resolved. Nevertheless, the law of universal gravitation remains scientific. So, science is a methodological process of spiraling upward. If you think you are all-knowing and that everything you believe is right, you're akin to religious leaders from the Middle Ages. On one hand, you say, evolution is just a hypothesis branding it as pseudoscience. On the other hand, you claim that humans must have been created, and that is true science. Please, my friend, first understand the basic definitions and avoid contradictions. Since Darwin proposed the theory of evolution 160 years ago, just like any scientific theory, it has been subjected to countless attempts of falsification or confirmation by scholars. However, the fossil evidence has only increased further supporting that evolution aligns with experimental data. To be honest, when it comes to evolution, you have the right to believe or not. But don't enjoy the delicious fruits and vegetables that were selectively bred over generations, and then burp and criticize the efforts of scientists. Someone might ask, what if evolution is overturned one day? Whatever, it is currently correct. The rise of anti-intellectualism attacking various sciences is fundamentally because science is grounded, relying on logic and mathematics, not just casual talk. Evolution faces the most attacks from these anti-intellectuals because, just like writing an essay in an exam, it's the only thing they mistakenly believe they can understand. They can't grasp calculus, let alone oppose it. People admire certain things because they aspire to become like that and they often denigrate things because they lack the ability to attain them. You can only progress by improving yourself, taking the right path. If you choose the wrong path and try to elevate your superiority through fallacious fallacies, what you perceive as science will leave you with nothing but paranoia and foolishness. Darwin wrote on the origin of species because he sailed around the world and witnessed a vast array of animal samples making it difficult for him to accept the narrow logic of creationism. If you can't find the time to read scientific papers, then traveling like Darwin might be a good choice. If you don't have the time or ability to explore the entire world, then at least open your phone and see where others travel, or engage in discussions and learning with diligence and dedication. Over time you will find that wisdom will radiate from your eyes,